Welcome to Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene in Caldwell, Idaho. This is the Sunday morning service. And now your speaker, Senior Pastor Brian Dyer. We're in Acts chapter 8 this morning. Acts chapter 8. The voice of the Spirit. Now, we were at the prison, uh, I guess just a week or two ago, and we sang this song. And it was one of those 7 Eleven songs. The words were seven words that they sing 11 times. And, uh, and I don't usually like those songs because, um, because I like good theology in my, in my songs, in my music. And so that's why I'm, I even favor hymns over choruses because um, I, uh, I like that. But when we sang this song, it really, it really convicted me of the fact that music is not about just teaching theology. It's about worship. And it's about listening and being in tune with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's about me aligning myself with where God's at. And that, and that really challenged me over the course of the week as to where I was headed. Um, so that's why I wound up in Acts chapter 8 with you this morning. Um, it's one of those a little more obscure passages. It's not like one of the bigger ones. You guys have probably heard of Philip the Evangelist. He's not the apostle. There's another Philip. Um, there's one Philip the apostle. This is Philip the Evangelist. There were, um, uh, we read about in Sunday school. I took them through that in chapter first. In Acts chapter six, there was this argument that arises over the distribution of food to the widows. Some of the widows felt like they were getting enough and the other ones felt like they weren't getting enough. And the people who were uh, their kinsmen said, dude, our widows are being overlooked in the distribution of food. You guys got to make this right. And they bring it to the apostles, and they say, man, these, we're not getting the food distributed right. And the apostles said, um, go away, you bother me. And they, said, uh, they said, you guys actually have enough authority, believe it or not, to take care of this yourself. Um, you have it within your means at your disposal. And they say, pick seven men full of the Holy Spirit and grace and truth to administer this, the, the bread to the ladies so that they all get enough to eat. And I think it's kind of funny that they go, get your seven godly men to hand out the food. I go, really all they had to have was arms. I mean, you know, seven guys. You get some and you get some. It really, didn't, it w- it really wasn't that complex. But they say, get your seven men who are above reproach, guys with integrity. And they, and they pick out these, these, uh, these men to, do, to distribute the food. The first one that of more notoriety is Stephen. Stephen is, one of, uh, is the first Christian martyr. He's, he's stoned to death, um, and he's put to death for his faith when he stands up and tells all the leaders. And he, well, actually what happens is so many people start coming to Christ, they get more afraid, and the leaders put him to death. And he tells them about why, why they need to accept Jesus. And they say, it's easier just to kill you than it is to listen to all this stuff about Jesus. So they put him to death. That's Stephen. This is one of the other guys. His name is Philip. His name is Philip. Oh, let me tell you what he does. Before this passage, too, this is just background. This just doesn't count towards my time, towards my sermon. Is a, uh, he goes to Samaria and starts preaching. Samaria, can you believe it? I mean, the, the headquarters of the, of the Israelite nation up there, he goes up there and starts telling them about Jesus. And people start becoming Christians, you know? So that's Philip. So this Philip is, I, I don't know, he must have... I really wish I could have heard those guys. I mean, you know, to have walked with Jesus, to know him like they did, and to, and to be able to preach with that kind of power, you know? And he, and he goes into the place where his enemies are, where they hate him. This would be equivalent to going to one of the Muslim countries today. You know what I'm saying? To go someplace where, they, where you walk in and they go, hey, we hate you. You know, um, this is it. He goes in there, he tells them about Christ, and he's powerful, and many people become Christians. So this is what happens to him right on the heels of that experience. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. I mean, this is a guy of some pretty good notoriety in the Ethiopian courts. I mean, this is somebody of a little bit of, of clout who actually waits on the queen in her inner court. Um, 
He was in charge, listen to this, Chad, this tells you how important he was. He was in charge of all this, of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot and when he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you were reading? And he said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Listen to this passage. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Does that remind you of anybody? <sighs> Glory. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Father, we pray this morning that you would add your blessing to your word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts which you have us to hear. Help us, Lord. Help us to have ears that hear the spirit. Help us, Lord, to not drown out the, the, the voice of our Heavenly Father with all the voices around us. Oh, we pray, dear God, right now, you'd hide your speaker behind the cross. Uh, your word prevail, not mine, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, it was, the intriguing concept I had was this. In the Old Testament, the people are blessed and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And many, many times you hear about the Spirit coming upon a prophet, coming upon... Daniel coming upon Samson, all of these people that the Spirit comes upon, and they listen to the Holy Spirit. Here's a question, okay? If we today, now Philip was after the day of Pentecost, so he joins with our crowd, but if we also are filled with the Holy Spirit, why is it that we don't hear from the Spirit today? Why do, if you are filled with the Holy, how many of you believe that when you accept Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, you're filled with the Holy Spirit? You believe that? Yes. Good. I'm glad that you believe it. It's true. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a part of your conversion experience. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, why do we not hear the voice of the Spirit? Intriguing. Now, sh don't, don't, don't try and jump ahead of me. Um, I believe that that's, there's, there's going to be a couple, of, a couple of things about that. Um, so l let me re review. Philip is a deacon in the church went to Samaria as an evangelist. And he hears from an angel. He hears from an angel. Now, we're not exactly sure. Um, uh, lots of people saw angels. Um, and I wonder sometimes, do we see angels today? Um, hmm. I didn't, I didn't put it on your sheet. I put, today, lots of people, I don't think I did, today, lots of people claim to see angels. They see Jesus, they see Elvis, they see, see Bigfoot. You know, um, there's a lot of things that people claim to see today, but do they really see angels, angels of the Lord? Or maybe the angels are busy now. They just don't have time. Now, I believe that there are a lot of angels that we see in the Bible, but they don't always appear as the winged creatures that we imagine. Some do. Some do. Some do, obviously. But uh, the angel, uh, this angel was a messenger from God. Balaam's angel was a donkey. His angel was a donkey. Moses' angel was a burning bush. You know, sometimes, sometimes they don't come in the way that you think that they'll come. A message from God may come from some place a little more obscure than that. Sometimes, my, my, my first angel was my grandma. I'm going to tell you, she was a messenger from God. I frequently heard from God via my grandma's mouth for a long time. When I would imagine God speaking to me, it was in my grandma's voice. You know, it's like, ah, you know, okay, I, I get it. You know, you know yeah, I get it. It's an interesting concept because in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the church's angels. 
the messengers from God for, for each of the churches when God speaks to them in Revelation. And, and most theologians believe that that's referring to a pastor or a prophet or some kind of a speaker appointed to the churches. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. that We're, we're disciples, but we're, in a way, we're also kind of the angels ourselves to the world around us. We're the messengers of God. We're the carriers of that good news. Bill appears from an angel, and the angel says, you know, um, uh, take off and uh, I head down uh, from Jerusalem to Gaza. Take off on that road. I, I wrote this just to reinforce. Anyone uh, that delivers a message from God is a messenger of God. I mean, that's not really that tough to figure out. But Philip was led by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. Um, Philip did not use the New Testament when he started speaking. Do you follow that? He didn't use the New Testament. I'm listening for the voice of the Spirit. The Spirit leads him. When he starts talking to the eunuch, he doesn't use the New Testament. If you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, wouldn't it make sense to use the New Testament? Doesn't it make sense that Philip would say, wait a minute, let me open up. Instead of going to Isaiah, wouldn't it make sense if he opened up to John? It would have made sense had John been written. But since John hadn't been written yet, it would have been a little difficult. He couldn't open up to Matthew because Matthew hadn't yet been written. None of those books were there. We have an advantage on Philip in hearing the voice of the Spirit. When we really want to hear the voice of God, it's already been spoken for us. And it's been written down so that we have it. We don't have to puzzle ourselves. Um, if I want to tell somebody about Jesus, I can use John or I can use uh, Romans. Today, we have the comprehensive word of God. We have it. We have God's Holy Spirit revealed to us. The word of the Spirit is not hard for us as Christians. All you got to do is open your Bible. You open your Bible and you're hearing from God. Is that not amazing to you? Sometimes when I sit down and I read the Bible and I open up, in my Bible, um, the words of Jesus are written in red. Are they written in red in yours? And when I open that up and I just think, these are actually the words that Jesus spoke. I, I kind of stand in awe of that. It just, it just humbles me. It, it, it blows me away that I can read the words of Jesus. That I, can, I mean, I can do it. I mean, I can, re I can read those. I can, I can open it up, and I can be in touch with what God is speaking, and what he spoke then and what he speaks now is still written to me. I'm the recipient of that blessing. You are too if you read the Bible. If you're not, you're not the recipient of that blessing. You're ripping yourself off. You're not hearing from the voice of the Spirit because you're not reading the Bible. But if you are reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit's already speaking to you. How many of you, when you're reading the Bible, the Spirit tells you something else? Because I can read something in the Scripture, and I read it through, and I read it through, and I read it through, and I've studied it. I mean, I've studied it. When I was in college, I had to rewrite the New Testament, uh, most of it. I had to rewrite it. So, um, is, you know, like uh, uh, you, those of you who use the message, is, is that concept has actually been around for quite a while. Um, in, 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 in class, I wish I'd have had the message because then I would have just copied it. But is, uh, I had to go through and read all of the, I had to read all of the New Testament in one translation or another, and then I would have to write the, rewrite the whole thing in my own words. So I read it. I've studied it. I mean, I've studied it in depth, right? And I sit down with a group of Christians who are not, they're not, they're not near as smart as I am. You know, they're just not near as smart as I am. And I sit down with them, and I say, listen, simpletons, as your, as your exquisite master explains the intricacies of the scripture to you, peons, gather around. And then they say something that I've never thought of that has never even begun to scratch the surface of my brain before. And I think, where did that come from? How did you come up with that? That is amazing to me. You know, and I'm, and I'm humbled. You know, the scripture, the scripture speaks to all of us. The Holy Spirit can speak to anybody who's a recipient, who has ears to hear, who's willing to listen. If you're willing to listen, God wants to speak. But the truth of the matter is, we often don't want to listen. The Holy Spirit's trying to speak, and we just don't want to listen to him. We want to busy ourselves. If I get busy enough with everything else, then maybe God will just leave me alone. 
You're right. If you're busy enough, he will leave you alone. That's a scary thought. You ever been in a place where you really felt like God completely left you alone? Well, the place where you don't hear from God? The place where you are so out of touch with where God wants you to be that you can't hear his voice any longer? Been there once in my life. I don't want to go back. It's scary. It's scary when you put yourself out of sync with the Holy Spirit. When you don't listen long enough. The scripture says eventually that the Spirit of God will not always struggle with the Spirit of man. If we tell him to leave us alone long enough, he will leave you alone. He'll leave you alone. That's a, the blessing and curse of autonomy. Philip was carried away by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. Uh, today we don't hear because we don't read. Sorry. I get ahead of myself sometimes. Always. Philip was carried away by the Spirit. We're too busy with things that don't matter as much. He was, he was engaged in the Scripture. He did everything he could to be engulfed in the place where Jesus was at. He knew where Christ was, and that's where he wanted to be. He wanted to be in the place where God was going to bless him, and he was telling people about him. I think sometimes why we don't hear from the Spirit is maybe we have doubts. We have doubts. What if I believe is wrong? What if I'm not wrong about this or wrong about that? Or what if the concept and way that I pray is wrong or the way that I approach the Lord is wrong? Maybe we think that we're wrong in some way. Or maybe we think that just being out of sync with the Lord puts us in a place where we can't hear from him. Maybe there's all of those doubts. But it really also dawned on me too, maybe we, another reason we don't hear from the Spirit is because we're afraid. Um, I don't know where I push this thing at. There it is. We're afraid of the truth. What if I'm right? What if I'm right? You know, think about this. What if David killed Goliath? And there was nothing special about David. What if he really was just some kid? What if he was? I mean, you know, it's like, what if David was Dylan? You know, I mean, what if he really wasn't anything special, just some kid? You know, I mean, you just go, he's just some guy. He may be special to his mom. I mean, Di Diane, and Diane might think he's special, I hope, ma'am, sometimes. You know, is, what if he really was just a kid? What if Mary was just a girl? What if Mary was... I mean, we, we know that she was holy and godly. We get the Magnificat from her. She was amazing. But what if she really was just a girl? What if, what if the Mary of the Bible was not that much different than Mary Heck? Mary Laurie now, sorry. What if Mary really was just Mary? What if I really am capable of all the things that they did and more? What if all of the authority that belonged in the Old, New Testament and Old Testament, what if all of the things the apostle did are really within our grasp? What if Philip is not this ideal that you can't attain, but what if each and every single one of us are really capable of living up to the same standard of holiness and godliness in our own lives that each of the apostles attained to? What if all of us that we see, the ideals that we see, the most holy person you know is a standard you can actually attain to? What if all of it's true? Do you know what that means? That means that we don't have excuses. That means that when we hear from the Holy Spirit, we can, actually re we can actually yield and do the things that we're called to do. We can live above where we're at. And we don't want to change. Oftentimes, I believe we don't want to hear from the Holy Spirit because he's going to tell us something we don't want to hear. He's going to ask us to make a sacrifice or to do something outside the realm of our own comfort zone. And if he starts speaking stuff that caused me to be outside of me and I want to be inside of me, then we have a conflict. So sometimes I believe the reason we don't hear the voice of the Spirit is because, strictly speaking, we don't want to. We don't want to. What if God could speak to you? What if God wants to speak to you? And you, we're like the, the Jews when Stephen was speaking, and they said that they put their hands over their ears and they screamed at him. Blah, blah. That's what, I mean, like, they were so mad, they didn't want to hear anything except for what they wanted to hear. And they just yelled and screamed so that they couldn't hear anything else. And God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be righteous. He wants us to be set apart from the world. He wants the world to look at us and to, and to see that there's something different about us than there is about them so that they'll be drawn to Christ. He wants people around us to know that there's something peculiar about us, and we don't want to be peculiar. We want to fit in. We want everybody to accept us. But to be accepted by the world is to be rejected by our Messiah. 
If we're going to fit in completely with everybody else, we're going to talk like them, we're going to act like them, we're going to do the things that they do, then are you really even a Christian? To be a Christian is to be different. It's to, it's to speak differently. People should be able to tell from our conversations the words that we use. I spoke it at the prison. When I was talking to the prisoners, I said, hey, guys, stop cussing. Stop using foul language. You know, and, and I said it easy. Guys, if you're using bad language, you're here. At least be as holy as the prisoners. Stop cussing. Stop using f- foul language. It doesn't belong in the, in, in the mouths of the righteous. It doesn't. We need, to be, we need to be a holy people, and people around us need to see that there's something different about us. Our vocabulary should be different. The way that we approach other people should be different. Everything about us should be different. But if we choose to neglect that, if we choose to act like everybody else acts, then we should not expect to hear from a God who's trying to take us in a different direction. You know, um, I didn't put it on here. You know, when I was a little kid, I remember going out to the store with my mom. There was a whole bunch of us. You know, there were seven in a family. So by the time, uh, by the time there was about five of us, she started doing things differently than she did when there were less of us. You know, so we should go to the store, and uh, she'd leave us out in the car. I don't know if she put the windows down or not, Jim. I, 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 think, she, I think she glued them shut. You know, she should leave us in the car. It was calming. You know, because if she took us all in the store, there's only room for two of you to ride on that cart, maybe three at the best, and one inside if he stood on his head. So, you know, is a... She didn't take us inside. She left us in the car. You guys stay in the car. I'm going to go do some shopping. Then she'd go in shopping. I don't even know if she was really shopping. I think she's just walking around with a cart for a couple hours. I said, you know, she, she, she'd come out with a package of, 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 of aspirin. You know, you, you, that took you two hours? Come on, Mom. You're milking it. She'd go out and she'd go shopping. She'd do her shopping stuff. Actually, the funny thing is she usually came out with two carts. That's how our family was. And she'd, she'd, she'd go in and shopping around and stuff. And we'd sit in the car. We'd get bored. And so we'd jump over top of that back seat, jump up in the front seat, start the car up, take it out, of the, out peel it out of the driveway, go, go drive around town with that thing while she's inside. And then we'd, did, we'd hot rod it and pop it up wheelies and everything else, jump and that's, that's what we thought we were doing. As a matter of fact, we didn't have the keys to the car, so we were just actually sitting there behind the steering wheel going, mm, just playing. Just playing. We really weren't going anywhere or doing anything. We were just mimicking and going through the motions. I believe that that's a lot of people's Christian journey. They're just mimicking and going through the motions. They haven't really engaged. You know you know how to do better than you're doing. You know how to be in a different place than you're at. But you prefer to stay where you're at because it's comfortable. And the Holy Spirit beckons us to sell out, to get rid of those things in our life that don't belong, to be the people that God has called us to be. You know, a funny thing about a car, too, is when you're, when you're taking off, especially you guys... Now they have power steering. It's not so noticeable. Would you guys ever have the power steering go out on your car? It is an exciting adventure. But when you're sitting on a car, if you try and turn that baby while it's not moving and there's no power steering, you just can't turn it. Once it gets going, then you have it moving, and then you can turn it. But a parked car barely steers at all. You just can't steer it. The Holy Spirit can't steer a parked car. you got to be moving. you got to be doing something for the Lord, something, anything. Can you find anything to do for Jesus? If you do something, you go, well, I might do something wrong. You will do something wrong. Make a mistake. Do something stupid for Jesus. We're going to make our own T-shirts. Do something stupid. for Just do something. At least make a mistake for the Lord. Can you offer anything at all? Is your, is your offering only going to be lethargy and apathy and sitting and coasting along? Do something for Jesus. The Lord will bless you. You'll hear him. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. If you want to listen, if you want to listen. Thanks for joining us today. You can find Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene on the web at eusticknaz.org and on many social media sites at Eustick Naz. Thanks and God bless.